available to you in case you want to uh, view the uh, session again. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, all of you, Guat Kiang, Guat Ching, Pat Mini, thank you for being here. I really appreciate your being here. Uh, and uh, we are meeting here for the first time, Guat Kiang. So I, I'm Mazuki, and as I mentioned, what I do is that now I have uh, this session uh, every week. Previously, I uh, have twice a month. That is the first week of the month on neurosemantics, and then the third week of the month uh, focusing on meta coaching. So what I've done since about two months ago is that I fit in another two more sessions. Uh, the second week of the month, I talk on uh, communication and relationship, and the fourth week of the month, uh, focusing on parenting. So now the topic on uh, coaching, meta coaching, uh, let me just admit Jessica just coming in. Uh, the topic on meta coaching is rather, as I mentioned just now, rather technical because we are going in in depth because we have covered the more general topic regarding coaching uh, because actually the discussions on coaching uh, has been going on close to three years already. <laughs> so we are going in deeper and deeper and deeper, right? So Jessica, good to see that you're here. We have just started. Uh, great that you can make it and you can remember. <laughs> Uh, let me just uh, begin this uh, evening session uh, with just a broad overview of the of, of the what we are going to be discussing today. What I will be doing is I will be speaking for about five to ten minutes or so, and then I'll be uh, opening up for questions and discussion. In that way, uh, you don't get bored listening to my voice all the time, and I I don't get bored listening to my voice. I can hear. Uh, your questions, uh, if I can answer them, I'll do my best. Uh, and to, to listen to your ideas with respect to uh, what we covered in the last, what, five or 10 minutes or so. Okay, so for this evening, uh, with respect to our discussion, what we'll be uh, discussing about this evening is on the topic of mirroring as the basic coaching skill. So some of the questions that we'll be discussing uh, in this evening session is, is there a mirror for our mind and heart? If we wanted a human mirror so that we can see ourselves more clearly, where would we go for that mirror? And how do coaches provide a mirror for clients? And as a coach, how can we make sure that the mirror we present is clean, accurate, and useful rather than like a distorted mirror from a circus show? So a couple of things just to mention here. When you wake up in the morning and you look at the mirror in the bathroom, why do you look at that mirror in the bathroom every morning? You, even after you have your shower, you are dressed up, and even when you are uh, working from home, you still look at the mirror. <laughs> Sometimes it's just to make sure that we look okay, that nothing stuck here and there or whatsoever, right? So, what if? you are able to look into a mirror that would reflect more, not just your physical appearance. A mirror that would show you a reflection of your actions and behaviors, of your attitudes and presence. Now that would be interesting, wouldn't it? And that mirror is not imagine, uh, imaginary. That mirror is the coach. So that's why we are talking about mirroring as the basic coaching skill. So first 
topic that we'll be discussing this evening is that the magic of mirroring. We have all had conversations with close friends that allowed us to see ourselves, perhaps for the first time, clearly and without pretense. Have we not? Talking with, you, with, uh, with your friend, it is then that we find ourselves relaxing, dropping our guard, and sharing uh, our heart and experience. And our friends are just simply reflecting back what he or she hears with curiosity and interest. And it is in those moments that sometimes we glimpse of ourselves in the mirror of the other person's eyes, mind, words, and hearts. This is where and how we can experience a human mirror. The mirror for our soul, our inner heart and mind, and values and hopes and dreams. It occurs in the presence of a non-judgmental friend or associate who engages us in conversation without any agenda of his or her own. There is no agenda except to share, to disclose, to discover. So this is what we are referring to, having a mirroring conversation. A mirroring conversation is a conversation that is non-judgmental. No agenda except to see what is to be and to experience a safe environment and context. Relaxation and dropping off one's guard. I don't need to, to protect myself. I am just who I am with this person. And a willingness to be truthful to what is rather than trying to impress. I would say one of the things that I'm grateful about with respect to my own personal professional growth is that when I first started training, I conducted training for school children. Uh, and when I conduct training for school children, I get just absorbed in that. Because little children, they are non judgmental, <laughs> they are so clean in their mirror. And until today, uh, that's why, uh, for those of you who are familiar, uh, 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 with me, uh, having discussions with me, I keep on mentioning the fact that I learn so much from children. Because what happens is that they are so clean in their mirroring that I am learning about myself as I am interacting with them. And the thing about children, uh, how many of you notice whether you have children of your own or, or your little brothers or cousin, they don't hide. <laughs> they like you, they let you know. And if they don't like you, they let you know as well. <laughs> that's a clean mirror. So that's the first point. Uh, the magic of mirroring to be able to see what is. And compared to the normal mirror that we see at home, a coach who's able to uh, mirror the client, a coach is able to let me see my actions, my behaviors, my mindset, my beliefs, my attitudes. And that gives me the ability to make changes. For example, you go and see the mirror in the, uh, in the bathroom. You see, oh, this hair out of place. Oh, this hair out of place. Oh, I'm losing hair over here. So you are making changes because of the cleanliness of that mirror. So similarly, uh, having a conversation, the magic of mirroring is that the coach is able to mirror back to us who we are, how we are operating, and in that way, we can make our changes. So questions and comments, first of all. Sorry, I keep moving this thing because it keeps falling off my ear. <laughs> it 
it doesn't stick well. So any comments or questions? Yes, Ashish. Okay. Can we or can someone get a distorted mirror, like a convex or concave mirror? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens when the coach is judgmental. I was mentioning uh, the, the mirroring conversation, non-judgmental acceptance, no agenda. So when the coach comes into the coaching conversation with his or her own agenda, that's when... Hashim, when you mention distortion, that's when distortion occurs. Because now you are not receiving, um, uh, receiving raw data. Now you are receiving data that has been changed by the coach. So in that uh, way, the, the information that you are receiving is now distorted. Yeah. And it is not very useful. It is not very useful. Thank you, Asha. So that's why we see, or we sometimes we, we encounter coach, so-called coach, who actually project uh, that he knows, uh, whereas he doesn't know. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's why we keep reminding ourselves as coaches, the star of the show is the client. Not me as the coach, and that, and and some people because they are so used to being the expert. So even with the clients, they want to show themselves to be the expert. As a coach, I need to remind myself that I am here for the client. My value is through the client's success. My value is to bring the client to greater height. It is not for me to show how uh, clever or intelligent I am. However, I am here to show how clever and intelligent the client is. So that's why I want to be able to mirror that. So thank you, Hashim. Any other comments? So you are good for now? Okay. Let's move uh, on to the next uh, point. The next point is on mirroring tools. So as a coach, I want to be a clean and accurate mirror for the client. So what are the tools that are at my disposal? Now, the mirroring conversation plays a critical role in coaching precisely because it is through mirroring back that we give our clients a safe sense of self, their lives, their heart and soul. They don't need to pretend. They feel safe. And know that few of our associates, uh, loved ones, family or friends can do this for us. They are too involved, too emotionally invested, too overly identified. And that's when the judgment comes in. So that's when we cannot feel safe to be ourselves. To accurately reflect back as a coach to a client without judgment, without an agenda, and without evaluations, either good or bad, we have to move into a know-nothing state. Yeah. So we come back to this point again. So that's why in ACMC, we keep reminding uh, to ourselves to be in the know-nothing state. Know-nothing in terms of the client. I know nothing about the client. I just want to reflect to the client who or what he or she is presenting to me. Only then can we lose our mind and come to our senses sufficiently so that we can operate in the see, hear, feel world of sensory acuity. <clears throat> to become and experience sensory awareness is to momentarily Leave the world of evaluations, judgments, understandings, meanings, knowledge, and assumptions. 
And that's why the no nothing state is critical. Otherwise, the client is giving me information. I'm trying to make sense of the information based upon my value judgment, based upon my understandings. And that is not what the client is. So I need to be in the no nothing state. Whenever they say something, I need to reflect it back to the client to understand where it is coming from. Instead of understanding it from how I understand it, that's a major difference. Uh, people uh, look at things, the perspectives. Uh, just this afternoon, I was working on the uh, presupposition, the map is not the territory, that everybody's got a different map. So when you present to me your map, it is none of my business <laughs> to compare your map with mine, because your map is your business. My map is my business. So as a coach, it's none of my business to bring my map into this conversation. I need to put it aside. Uh, people use the word, uh, put your ego in your pocket. In the case of coaching, put your mind in your pocket and come to your senses. Okay. Now, on, and only through mindful and rigorous practice that we become skillful in sensory equity. Without sensory equity, we are meeting our coaching client at our model of the world rather than his or her model of the world. So I am evaluating, I am judging it. So I need to lose that mind of mine and use my sensory equity what I see, what I hear, what I uh, feel, what I smell, what I taste of the information that you are giving me and understanding it the way that you understand it. So this is the danger with most coaching, counseling, consulting, and other forms of helping. Instead of truly and accurately hearing and seeing a person on their own terms, we encounter them through our filters. So this speaks about the contamination of communication. We contaminate the communication with our frames. So the thing about consultants, counselors, is that they are evaluating the correctness of what the client is saying based upon uh, the consultant or counselor's value system. And in coaching, we are not doing that. We are not, um, we are not evaluating the correctness of what the client is uh, giving to us apart from how the client is evaluating it for themselves. So that's why the conversation goes meta so that they can understand their frames and notice how well they are performing according to their frames. So that's why I need to be clean. So these are the tools of mirroring. Okay, so questions or comments? So before I continue on, uh, just to acknowledge uh, Franska, uh, Dr. Anwar, Marilyn swimming happily at the back there. <laughs> Xavier joining us for the first time. Thank you for being here, Xavier. Uh, and also Izaning. Uh, good to see that. Yes, Padmini, you give a, a, a question that can give an example of this. Uh, which part are you referring to? Because I think I uh, missed that. Example uh, of uh, what is that? Okay, I was thinking that it would actually be quite a feat not to have your thinking involved in when you want to give some kind of uh, coaching command. So how do you actually completely remove your 
thinking and values in being able to do this i mean from what you were explaining mm -hmm. okay thank you uh the, the 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 thing about it is that we cannot stop ourselves thinking so we continue on thinking however what am i thinking about so as a coach i'm thinking about what you say to me what you reveal to me i don't compare it with my meanings i don't compare it with my values because this are what makes me now you have a different frame a different matrix about your life you have different meanings you have different thoughts you have different values you have different frames of references so in order for me to give the best service to you i do not want to contaminate that what you have within you i do not want to contaminate that with mine so that's what we are referring to know nothing so when i have this conversation to you i put aside my values i put aside my uh, understandings the meanings the meaning of life uh, i am not here to <laughs> to lecture you about the meaning of life because that meaning of life is mine yours is different so i'm here to listen to you to understand you and as i listen and understand you and i feed it back to you like a mirror and because i don't know you this know nothing i ask questions and it is those questions that are asked out of curiosity not asked out of judgment have you been asked a rhetorical question and you don't feel like answering ah huh, marilyn people ask you rhetorical question might as well don't answer lah <laughs> but when people ask you with curious question and you become curious of your own answer that's when you get to the heart of what's inside that's running the show so my thinking is reserved to the processes so no content i only make use of the content that you give me yeah. so in other words your questioning should be geared towards making that person think of an answer and trying to resolve their own issues absolutely because as a coach i'm not here to solve your problems i have enough of my problems to solve <laughs> <laughs> now this is this is at the core of empowerment if i solve your problem i'm not empowering you i'm the one who's holding the power when you solve the problem yourself you are using your power so that's why even if uh you are in a topic we are discussing about a topic that i'm the expert in yeah for example i'm the expert swimmer and there is this new swimmer coming here <laughs> so as a coach even though i know my answer i need to bite my tongue on that answer to let the client find their own answers because once they find their answers they are powerful so the role of the coach is to make the client powerful they find their own power and they proceed from there whenever i give my solution to them i am disempowering them thank you thank you i hope that makes sense yeah yeah thank you okay right so let's move to our next point which is non judgmental awareness how many of you here are, are running the meta program of uh judging <laughs> we have this this meta program of judging and perceiving <laughs> okay so this is where as a coach you need to take that marker from judging 
and shift it all the way to perceiving. So for those of you, your, if your meta program is judging, then you need to take a few deep breaths before you go into the coaching <laughs> conversation so that you can shift that. So having the skill of shifting your meta program is uh, important. At the same time, there are things that we can do in order to help ourselves to come to this point of non-judgmental awareness. Now, first thing is that not knowing our client is a great advantage as a coach. It gives us a fresh advantage. Others may judge them based upon belief maps that color their perceptions. As a coach, this is a, we start off as strangers getting to know one another. And since we are strangers, so we can curiously explore afresh with respect, honoring their uniqueness and asking the most obvious and dumb questions. And then through the use of non-judgmental awareness, simply reflect back uh, what we hear. Now, one of the, uh, I would say, people can call it a dumb question. However, that question really opened my eyes at that time and it has served me for all these years was when my daughter Sophia was about, uh, I think she was about five or six years old. She asked me the question. Uh, and at that moment, it could be termed as a dumb question because she asked the question, Daddy, kenapa api tu panas? Why is fire hot? I mean, you will not ask me because your thinking will be, huh, he might think that I'm stupid for asking such a stupid question. But she asked it out of curiosity. And that dumb question, so to speak, just sparked uh, a, a host of new ways of thinking for me. And that, from that question, that instigated in me a new way of looking at little children. They are so intelligent, so smart. Because what I got from that, wow, children are so intelligent. They can ask me questions that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> so uh, be ready for that, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy that moment that uh, and to look forward yeah, to look forward to to receiving questions that you don't know the answer <laughs> and at that point in time the best answer that you can give to your child is i don't know the answer let's look for the answer together so that's the advantage uh, of when, when you are coaching a, a person, a client, the advantage is that you do not know the client's history. So that's why the know nothing state is very important. Since I don't know the client's history, that's when I can ask all of those questions uh, purely out of curiosity. And that is a state that no one has with the circle of people around them. Um, a, a good example is if you were to go into business, do you notice that the people who go into business with you tend to be strangers? Because our relatives tend to judge us based on who we were not who we are now. <laughs> so that's why when you go into business, say, you are want to go into that business. I remember you last time. So that judgmental uh, part. So as a coach, not knowing the client is a plus point. So non-judgmental awareness is about accepting a person on his or her own terms. And that is the prerequisite for being non-judgmental. We take their words and gestures and body language 
and begin assuming that it all makes sense to the person. We then begin to explore how it makes sense. So they are behaving in a certain way and we keep asking questions. Through the questions, then their behavior now makes sense to us. And we bring in respect and honor. That makes it safe for the person to be and to become. This is also a rare and unprecedented encounter. Typically, our friends and loved ones cannot do this. One is that they are also too quick with evaluations and judgments uh, because all these years, uh, you've been that naughty little girl or naughty little boy. <laughs> so how could they trust you with, uh, in, uh, with uh, uh, thousands of ringgit of investment into a business? And the other thing is that because they care too much. They care too much to the extent that that clouds their objectivity about who you are and what you are going to become. Yeah? You were someone before and you are becoming somebody uh, in the future. The tendency for the people who know us is that they judge our future based upon our past. So that creates an issue. So non-judgmental awareness brings us back into the empirical world of sensory awareness. The seeing, hearing, feeling, uh, uh, taste. Now, and uh, how we got this was from a tennis coach and executive coach, Tim Galway. When he was uh, as a tennis coach, one of the things that he used to do is uh, to tell his client to just watch the ball, to watch the seams of the tennis ball as it comes to them, to observe the traje uh, trajectory of the ball. And the ball once again becomes a ball. Prior to that, the ball was a challenge, a threat, a possibility of embarrassment, a defeat. So now that ball carries so much meaning that they get scared or stunned of the ball. So come to your senses. So what he was teaching his, uh, uh, his tennis clients was, okay, so when the person hits the ball, look at the ball. On which side is the seam? How is it spinning? In which way is it spinning? What is the trajectory of the ball? So now they see the ball as the ball. And that is when they get the full picture of what's happening on the tennis court because it takes away all the unresourceful meanings and frames about that ball coming across into his court. Yeah. So non-judgmental awareness allows us to see again and afresh at the primary levels of what we see, hear, and do with a heightened sense of sensory awareness. This brings a new focus and relaxation without the judgment and agenda, the negative emotions of fear, anger, dread, all of this will melt away. So this releases the interference and allows more resourceful states to arise. Playfulness, interest, curiosity, wonder, learning, engagement, fascination. So the resourceful states begins to flow in. So questions or comments? Yeah, must. Yes. Uh, I, I was having a, a training session with uh, one of my associates uh, that was last month. And after two weeks later, 
uh, she came back to me and said, Hashim, yesterday morning, the client called me and said, I hate you. <laughs> I, I was curious and I asked her, what makes the client say that to you? And it's so serious. Yeah, she told you she was so serious that she said that to me. And she said, I was puzzled. And I asked her one question. What do you think that makes your client say that word to, to you? I'm lost, she, she, she said. I, I, I do not know where I have gone wrong. So, because I attended your online classes for this year and previously face-to-face, uh, -face, so I was telling her, possibly you made that judgment on that person that day. Okay. And you tell yourself as a consultant and, and, and uh, a professional consultant never judge people. Only the judge judge people. <laughs> then after that, a week later, yeah, last week she came back to me. Yeah, I think what you said is very true, Ashim. Okay. So thank you much. Uh, the class helped me a lot okay. to communicate with my associates. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. When when you mentioned that, I remember. I think I've mentioned to some of you uh, in the class uh, before. Uh, I had this experience attending. A, uh, I was conducting a training program for a group of uh, factory workers. So these are. Uh, these were uh, line managers, team leaders. And even before the class started, as the participants were arriving at the venue, uh, the PIC for the company came to me uh, and apologized to me. Oh, Mazuki, I'm so sorry. I do not know how these three people uh, managed to get here. I said, what three people? Uh, there were three people. They were uh, not on the list but they came to the training program. And he was describing these three people. Oh, these three people, they are troublemakers and all of those. So uh, what, what happened was, I think he took something like half an hour to apologize to me that three, these three people came to that training program. And I remember that as they were explaining, I was listening uh, to them. When I got off, from that conversation, I said to myself, I'm going to forget that. <laughs> I'm going to forget that they said that this, these three people are troublemakers and I'm just going to love them anyway. So because I was not judging them from the beginning, it allowed me the, uh, the patience and the curiosity to understand the behavior uh, to the extent that, you see, because they have been labeled as troublemakers for years. So what do they do? If you have a reputation as a troublemaker, so what do you do? You create trouble, ah. Otherwise your reputation rots out. <laughs> <laughs> However, I didn't hold that reputation for them. So when they, uh, because initially when I first started, they went really off tangent uh, with what I was saying. So instead of treating that as troublemaker, I handled it respectfully. And just to cut the story short, what happened was they started off because they need to maintain their identity as troublemaker. They started uh, off uh, by arguing with me uh, and I did not take the bait. I just handled them uh, respectfully because I did not take that judgment that they are troublemaker. Uh, 
by the time that we got to the first second for the third day they were the they became the uh, i would say they were leading in the learning by bringing all the others to learn at a higher level and the i would say the icing uh, uh, at the top of the uh, cake for me was when the others left uh, they came uh, they came to me the three of them uh, bye jessica see, uh, see you later uh, so they came to me and said i'm sorry if we have caused you trouble it's just that uh, we've uh, the last time we attended training program was nine years ago so these people are really good at, they're supposed to attend training every year and they managed to run away from training for nine years they were that good <laughs> It's just that uh, they, the, the, the last training program that they, they went to before coming to my program was they were treated very badly physically. Uh, it was a physical torture, mental torture. You know, the, the, the what do you call that, uh, BTN style of training, Bureau Tata Nagara style of training. Uh, and they swore that they are not going to attend any training after that. It's just that uh, I've been conducting training for that company at that time for about two years already. And they keep hearing the juniors coming in and say, wow, that was a wonderful training. And, and they were wondering, how could training be so wonderful? Huh? How could training be so enjoyable? Huh? Uh, and they decided to check me out. So that's how they attended that training. <laughs> and they came using their own car. Uh, they said that. Others came using the company bus. They came using their own car because if they don't like it, they'll just leave. <laughs> so they had their, their uh, escape uh, clause over there. It's just that because I was not judging them based upon their reputation, and they noticed that I was treating them respectfully holding the space for them to behave in ways that are best for them that created the change for them so uh, that is what non-judgmental uh, presence of others will do because that's when the client when they feel that they are not being judged they can admit to themselves their mistakes. Yeah. How many of you don't even admit to yourself you make mistakes? <laughs> don't talk about admitting to others. Even to yourself, you don't admit a mistake. But as a coach, when you hold that space, because change can only occur when there is awareness. Change occurs after awareness. So if a person is not willing to admit a mistake or wrong, they will not be able to change. So when you as a coach, you are non-judgmental to explore the client's frames about things. And when they feel that it is safe, they will, re they will be able to say to themselves, huh, that one is not useful. Huh? This one is not useful. Otherwise, they will play that role. That identity, I'm the troublemaker. You think you can uh, do anything to me? Ah? So they are having a mask, playing roles. And for some people, they play roles so well to the extent that they cannot even see themselves from behind that mask. Yeah? Okay. Yes, Marilyn. <laughs> um, wow. Really, everyone can can realize themselves, like, you know, like uh, basically find the answers themselves and find the truth um, and um, realize that, you know, they are, they are what they're not doing correctly. They can come, every one of us can come to that conclusion ourselves. Yes, 
with the tools that the coach brings to the conversation. You have the tools of uh, the meta levels of language, the meta model of language. So using those tools, the client now sees the distortions. Mm -hmm. They see the generalizations. They see the deletions. Mm -hmm. and, and because they're able to see that, then they realize, oh, that was where I made the mistake. So all that you are doing as a coach is to shine the light to the frames that they have. And um, even for 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 kids, not not young kids, like the children that I deal with, that I that I coach, I don't coach. I mean, swimming. I'm a swimming coach, um, but yeah, they are they are they are teenagers. Even at that age. Yes, even at the age, it's just that you need to remember the early teens. I I would say from uh, thirteen to fifteen their cognitive developmental level hasn't reached to the adult cognitive uh, way of thinking. So their logic uh, has not reached to what we call a healthy adult logic yet. So their logic is still mixed with uh, magical logic. So when you bring uh, information to them, when you bring logic to them, you want to match with the, uh, the level of logic that they have developed. That's all, yeah? so that's all. And when you bring in the conversation, uh, they can see that. When you bring the logic to their level, do not expect them, uh, especially 15 and below, do not expect their, uh, their cognitive level to be able to, uh, to be at par as a healthy adult. I deliberately use the word healthy adult because there are many adults. Their cognitive development has not reached to the health level yet. They are still operating at, uh, at magical thinking. Yeah. So many adults are still doing that. Yes, I was just about to say that it's not, not uh, exclusive to 15 and below. They can be above as well, right? Yeah. There, yeah. there are 70-year-olds there are who are behaving like five. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the uh, psychosocial stages, the cognitive developmental stages are critical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, I also have another question, like for, for me, right, a lot of my swimmers come to me for basic advice, right? That, that, that means they want my opinion or my judgment or evaluation on things, or how do I go about this? Mm -hmm. So yes, it seems as if that they want your opinion. Uh, at the same time, this is where you want to you want to dance between being a coach and mentor. You have the right qualification to be a mentor because you have achieved a high level of success in that arena. So you are qualified as a mentor. At the same time, you do not want to uh, you do not want to influence uh, uh, a charge, uh, a client, uh, a student purely on your strategy without them exhausting their thinking ability. So what I'm referring to is that when they come to you for advice, have they exhausted all of the avenues for solving that problem or they are just lazy? Hmm. Okay. So if you detect that, they may have not thought it through yet. So you torture them by asking question, asking question, let them find their own solutions. There are those who have really put their thought to it. It's just that they come to the, uh, they come to uh, uh, 
a, a blind alley. They just cannot move from there. Then you can dance into the mentor uh, role and give them guidance. Thank you. Yeah, so so in, in your case, you want to be able to balance that between a coach and mentor. Yeah, yeah Max. Yes. I think uh, if I were to put myself as a university lecturer or professor, mm. a student that come to me with, please, sir, help me, I, I'm stuck. But he has done nothing on the tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I have a friend, um, I met him in 2016, prior to that, the last time I met him was in 19, <laughs> 19, eh? in 19, uh, 1980, so 1980, 2016, 36 years. Yeah. And uh, we were together in first year civil engineering. For one whole year, uh, I knew about him. In the second year, he wasn't there anymore. And the lecturer mentioned that, oh, he's gone and joined another course. So I, I was quite curious about it. So when I met him in 2016, somehow his story stuck in my mind. <laughs> so when I met him, uh, he explained what happened to him. Um, he joined civil engineering because he has this notion that civil engineers, they build things that makes the world a better place for others. So that's why he wants to become a civil engineer. He wants to build dams. He wants to build bridges so that it can help other people. And when he entered civil engineering, he realized there was one thing that he did not have that made it difficult for him to become a civil engineer. Math. Civil engineers communicate using mathematics. We don't need English. We use mathematics to communicate. Yeah. He was terrible at math. And this is not the guy who say, uh, uh, like what you say, uh, Hashim, I don't know how to do this. I go to my uh, lecturer to ask for answers. He sought personal tuition with the lecturers to help him with his math. He stayed up all night to practice math until his health suffered in that one year. So this is the kind of person who really wanted to solve the problem, but he wasn't just built for it, uh, actually. So at the end of the year, when he went to see the lecturer that he's going to quit, the lecturer said, uh, Chris, I, don't, I will not let you quit because you are not a lazy student. I see how you work. Maybe we can do something. So the lecturer managed to find him another uh, faculty. Uh, he studied in that faculty. And thank goodness there was no math in that particular <laughs> area of study. And he excelled. Right? So uh, when you are mentor and coach, and uh, uh, Hashim as well, you are a consultant. So to be able to withhold, to not to too easily give to the client without them using all their uh, gray cells in order to uh, find the problems until they, they've, they've come to the limit of the competency. That's when you lift them up with the extra competency that you have. So that's why there is this dance that you need to play. The dance of being the coach, maybe stepping into the mentor role for a bit and then coming out from the mentor. And over here, I need to step into the consultant uh, dance. And maybe if I'm required to step into the 
therapist role, I step into that if I have the capacity to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's move on with a couple more uh, topics. Next topic is levels of awareness. Because the mirroring conversation involves sensory awareness, we have to recognize and distinguish between levels of awareness to develop this state as a skill and tool for coaching. The first level of awareness is most natural because it is the level of awareness we were born with. This is the primary state of seeing and seeing, hearing and hearing, feeling and feeling, smelling and smelling, and tasting and tasting. So it's the pure and innocent state, one that we see in babies and small children. So that's the first level of awareness. Now, when we develop opinions, ideas, associations, learnings, we develop a higher level of mind. Now we have thoughts and feelings about our first level thoughts and feelings. And so moving to a higher or meta level, we have moved to the meta state, the state about state. So this represents a higher level of awareness that's directed at our state. And so it is inward focus rather than the empirical sensory focus. The ability to distinguish between primary awareness and meta-awareness is critical for coaching. So this distinction enables us to know to go inward to work on the inner game or to stay outside and work on the outer game of the client. Okay, so those are the levels of awareness. So one is the external, and when we go internal, to know that there are multiple levels. So, questions and comments. With little children, it is more about that level of awareness, sensory based, because it is not until they're about 12 that they begin to develop the meta level. So that is why sometimes uh, parents, they complain, wow, my child is not disciplined. Huh? Everything I have to tell them to do, uh, eight years old, 10 years old. The, the, the reason why they are there, they are still uh, like animals. They are focused on the attention. What comes to the attention is what they give their attention to. What is outside there is what they give attention to. They have not learned to operate from intention. Intentional behavior only comes when a person starts to develop concepts. So yes, you can begin to develop children to be intentional in what they do through repetition. In that way, you are developing the mental uh, development uh, earlier. You can do that. At the same time, do not expect that because they are still operating at that level. And as a meta coach, what we also need to know is when we move inside, there are many different levels. A certain emotion, let's say uh, the emotion of anger, at the third level is different than the anger at the first level. So to be able to track that out. So these are levels of awareness. Any questions, Franska? Okay. Let's move with the next one is mirroring. 
through feedback in mirroring back the raw data to a client regarding what we see and hear we activate the skill of giving feedback and the skill of giving feedback is something that my own experience is that not many people have it needs to be learned yeah. mirroring feedback is not evaluations or judgment opinions intuitions or mind reading emotions or feeling okay. it is not or any of those mirroring feedback is reflecting back to a client cleanly the empirical data of the stimuli that they offered the raw data of what you saw heard felt and smelled sensory awareness to do that we have to cleanly discern the difference between what we actually experience in sensory awareness and how we interpreted and evaluated and judged as such so that's why earlier i mentioned to you the tool that we have is the meta model by meta modeling we are bringing in the data into sensory awareness yeah. so this is not an easy discernment to make because we live most of our life inside our own matrix of mental frames interpretations evaluations values and beliefs we take a drink of water the tendency is that i don't like this this awful that's an evaluation <laughs> i dare not give any description because my gustatory vocabulary is very limited but people who have gustatory vocabulary they can give a description of how that plain water tastes just like uh, just like this morning i uh, brought a bottle of water to the office i took a sip at it and it tastes odd so i went and threw it away and uh, made myself some uh, fresh one i don't know how to how to uh how to describe that i don't have the language for it so all that i can say is that it tastes awful now it tastes awful is an evaluative language and it is not useful for anyone else who hears that because they cannot imagine what that awful refers to yeah so uh to to be able to use clean language so giving feedback is not offering our evaluations interpretations or meanings about things when we cheer our clients about success that's not feedback it is our evaluation or approval as so it operates as a reinforcement so yeah so we need to be clear does it mean that we cannot cheer our client for the success yes part of the role of a uh, of a coach is to be a cheerleader <laughs> that's a, that's part of the role that we need to play when we disapprove ignore or judge that's not feedback it's evaluation of dislike disagreement or disapproval and may operate a negative reinforcement so that is also not feedback feedback occurs at the primary level of experience okay evaluation judgment interpretive interpretation and meaning occur at the meta levels of experience now we need to realize that this evaluation judgment interpretation it is not that they are bad we offer this to support or empower a client but we need to realize that they are not feedback we are leading a client from our model or matrix of the world so when we cheer them we are saying that what you have done matches this description 
and I am cheering it to you. So we are leading them to a certain performance. Be clear, it is not feedback. Yeah. Sensory-based feedback is me saying to Marilyn, I noticed that you had your head uh, upwards and your eyes went up uh, just now and your eyes were still and unmoving. That's sensory-based feedback. Have I made any judgment about that? So if I'm curious about that, I wonder, were you thinking about something specific at that moment? Okay, so sensory-based feedback, see here, feel. So as a coach, we mirror through giving feedback. Questions? Marilyn, um, you coach your students to when they swim. How precise is your languaging with respect to the movement of their arms and movement of their legs? Do you describe those uh, to your students? Uh, yes, I describe verbally, also visually, and also kinesthetically. <laughs> yeah, using different... Um, some of them will get it verbally, some of them will have to see, have to draw it out or watch a video or watch themselves. And then some of them I will have to hold and move their, their hands and legs. So that's yes. sensory-based feedback. Yeah, much easier in swimming than to do in <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so that's feedback. Thank you. Okay, right. So let's move to the next uh, uh, point coaching the mirroring conversation. To coach a mirroring conversation, we must first create and establish an atmosphere of safety so that the primary level truth can be spoken. Without safety, the mirroring process will feel threatening, even insulting and attacking to a client. The safety is our first emotional need. After we have established a safe atmosphere for us and the client, then we need the courage to speak what we see. This differs radically from typical conversation that we see in polite society. There, we seek to please, yet in that pleasing, our speech becomes very shallow and superficial. So the mirroring conversation in coaching seeks a higher authority, an authority that seeks to get to the heart of things identify key issues and concerns, and use feedback for accelerating the learning and transformation. So all of these take courage and can be quite demanding. Yet if, as we mirror, we respect, honor, and believe in the higher good and development of a client, then the mirroring feedback offers a way for the person to propel him or herself into higher levels of achievement, performance and being. And that is the intent and goal of the conversation. Okay. So to be able to have that safe, supportive uh, space for the client. So this is where the skills of supporting comes in to match, mirror the client, they feel safe, then we match, uh, then we mirror their uh, mental levels. All right. Any questions or comments? Yeah. 
You okay with that? Okay, let's move to the uh, next point. The magic of robust conversation. Robust dialogues are not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of ego strength to dance with that level of self-awareness, self-acceptance, and self-responsibility. The majority of the people fear reality in the raw, and so avoid it. That's why we prepare ourselves and others on entering the matrix by reminding ourselves and the other person that it is just frames. And in a coaching conversation, we keep reminding our client, uh, whether we meet them many times, we keep reminding them that the person is never the problem. If you have a problem, it's not you who is the problem. The frame is always the problem. So we need to keep reminding people that. Otherwise, they personalize it. So when they encounter a problem, they personalize it. I'm such a problem. right? So we need to keep reminding. It is not you. It is not the people. That's the problem. Is the frames. That's the problem. So once we change the frames, then we can change the game. So once we know this, we can enter the matrix and elicit the kind of robust and fierce dialogue that allows us to master the matrix. Because now the conversation is about the frame. So the client doesn't take it personally. The client is also willing to engage his or her frame in that conversation. The matrix has you and will have you until you develop the mindfulness to engage it to have an intense and passionate conversation about the frames of your matrix. The adventure begins with a frame of awareness. From there, we move into the frame of exploration, which allows us to interrogate them. Again, when, we, when I mention interrogate them, when we set the frame that the person is never the problem, the frame is always the problem, they have that sense that this interrogation is not them as a person. This inter interrogation is the interrogation of the frame. So challenge them, provoke them, set new and more empowering frames, and thereby transform our matrix of frames. So that's about becoming the master of our matrix. Otherwise, our matrix holds us and enslave us, they leash us. So people who want to grow, they want to go into their frames so that now they can be the frame master. They are the ones who set the frames to their lives rather than the frames that has, has been set by society, by family. Okay, so questions. If no question, let me just uh, go through some points of summary. While mirroring is one of the most basic coaching skills and is fairly simple to explain, understand, and see, typically it is not a natural or common skill. Effective mirroring in coaching necessitates a non-judgmental attitude and the advanced ability to pace, create rapport, and create a safe environment for exploring and the inner and outer games. So it requires practice. It is not natural, so it requires practice. Mirroring is depend demanding to the extent that it challenges the, the coach to step out of oneself, to get the ego out of the way, and to be fully present to and for the client. And from mirroring, we can then engage in a robust and even fierce conversation. 
that makes for positive transformations. So that's probably what I can uh, summarize our session this evening. So any final questions before we end? You're good. So, do you have those questions answered inside your head, Marilyn? Because I saw you. <laughs> yeah, it's very true, Max. Yes, I shame. Very true. Uh, my my grandchild. Uh, uh, the first one, the elder son, he is now in uh, standard two, and uh, he had access of his project at school uh, for the tomato plants. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided to share out uh, him and uh, our family, me and my wife. So we started to compete, uh, say to us, uh, so to speak, to plant the tomato plants. You know. And it, it happens that our plants grow higher mm -hmm. than his plants. Mm -hmm. So whenever we visited him, we, we checked the height and we said, this is our height. We showed the picture okay. because they cannot come to our place, but we do go to their place. And uh, he was asking me, Toba, uh, he called me Toba, why is that so? <laughs> so I said, Let's investigate because uh, a few months back, that was uh, December last year, I was playing football with him and he said to me, let's investigate. <laughs> so when I put that word, let's investigate, then he start to be very curious. So I, I think that that is where the conversation with that nine-year-old kid mm. that makes him to be aware that there is a concept developing in in his mind mm. <laughs> okay oh, okay thank you All right so any questions otherwise i'll just go through uh, uh each one of you and ask you if you have any comments that you would like to make before we end i'll start off with the my uh, top uh, of the my screen, Guat Kiang, Chia Guat Kiang. Do you have anything to comment before we end? I hope that you will be able you you were able to follow because uh, this is your first time joining. I can hear you. You are muted. Can you hear me? That's all right. I'll just move to uh, Guo Qing. Any comments from you before we end? Uh, hi, uh, Masuki. Thank you. Uh, okay. This session is useful. I think we can use it in the daily uh, to build a daily report and also communication. Yeah. Mm, okay. Thank you, Guo Qing. And Pat Mini. No, no comments. No queries. And thank you for an interesting talk. Thank you, Pat Mini. And Marilyn? I think what uh, what helped really, really helped me a lot is, is your the what the last point that you made. It's not the people that's the problem, it's always the frames that's the problem. Um, I think it's not, not only for the for you know the people that we're coaching, but I think more for me so that I don't judge and evaluate because. I tend to, yeah, I'll be like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with this person? You know, why is he always thinking like that? You know, like there's a personality, you know, the attitude problem, a personality, you know, but then to, to have that and then it, it, it's hard for me not to judge a person, you know, and ought to be evalu to evaluate the person. So I think, yeah, if I don't blame the person and instead the frames, that would, it, it, that's immediately switches me into a different mode. Yeah. 
so more you know oh okay let's let's check out what what this person's frame is about you know for for him or her to to be thinking of that way yeah instead of like what's wrong with this person <laughs> So yeah, thank you for that. I think that's right. a great, yeah. great tool that I can use. Right, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, and Hashem, uh, any words from you? Yeah, I think um, uh, the, the key word is uh, let's not be judgmental. And uh, let's not be uh, uh, in front of a convex or concave mirror. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has to be a clean, uh, a clean mirror. And uh, and uh, I, I don't want to be a judge because I leave the ju the, the job of uh, the judge to the Putu Hakim Negara. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Anwar? Okay, uh, thank you for a good revision session. Uh, I think to be like uh, Hashim said, I mean, it's not for me. It's easy. It, I mean, it's easy to give somebody, tell somebody to do to do something, give them advice, uh, tell them. But to stand aside and direct them, ask questions, and let them count on the solution, it's not easy. You know, it's very tempting to say, "Hey, do this," and you get it done. This, right? but yeah, it's a discipline. You've got to learn. Yeah, the discipline. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Right. Thank you. And next, uh, Xi Wang. Oh, thank you. The point there, the new info I received today is something new. A different way of seeing things, perception on the way we see and give our views. Thank you, Si Ong, for that uh, comment. Uh, and I hope that uh, what you have gained from this uh, session may be useful to you. Right. So, so Franska? Uh, this session is very good to remind myself about the no nothing stage and also the not just others. <laughs> okay. I have been practicing the not just others since I think a few years ago after okay. attending your class. And yeah. then now really improve a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was going through the uh, the picture 2015, the class that uh, you attended. Uh, seeing your face then and seeing your face now, vast <laughs> difference. <laughs> <laughs> that point on non judgmental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe at that time you were judging your, yourself too harshly. A lot. Do everyone as well. <laughs> 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 I think I think we all go through the phase. I think we all go through that phase. Yeah. Of judging ourselves and judging others. Yeah. Mm. Then we become wiser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, is any? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. So, sometimes I look mirroring in different context. Okay. So <laughs> context is like mm, like a mirror. So, so mirroring like just copying uh, another guy or copying uh, or whatever mirror, mirror in image. So I look sometimes. So when I come to this uh, coaching, then I say, oh, we have a different context of mirroring. So that's what I see today. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Zani. So with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you for being here uh, this evening. And uh, my, our next session, uh, next week, we are going to cover a topic on uh, parenting. <laughs> so uh, what I have decided is that for years, we have the uh, neurosemantics session on the first Thursday of the month and then the meta coaching on the third Thursday of the month. So uh, moving forward, I'll be filling in the slot of the second Thursday and the fourth Thursday. So the second Thursday will be uh, on communication and relationship. The fourth Thursday will be on parenting. So next week, the topic will be uh, parenting, hopes and expectations. 
that's what we'll do <laughs> next week. <laughs> so, uh, those of you who are keen to join in uh, that session for next week, uh, you are most welcome. Tomorrow, I'll send out the uh, invitation. So, for being here, I would like to again thank you for being here. I really appreciate your being here, and I look forward to seeing you again. So, with that, uh, good night and God bless you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.